I have a plan for what I'm going to preach going months down the road. I can tell you what I'm going to be preaching for Easter right now. Like that's how I, I, life is better when Andy has a plan. But uh, the one thing that denies my planning, defies it every year, are these Sundays, Advent. I can tell you what I'm preaching for Easter and beyond long before I can tell you what I'm going to do during the month of December because I struggle with it. I'm, I'm never quite sure what I'm doing with Advent until I get close. And so I, uh, I do what any preacher does. I uh, start scrambling. I read some more scripture, and then I look at other preachers and see what they're doing because I am not wise enough by myself. And so this, uh, this year I've been spending time with uh, Reverend Rutledge, a lady who loves Advent. She loves Advent enough to have published a book on it called Advent. And it's a rather thick book. She has a lot to say, I figure. That's the person I want to be talking to. When I'm, when I'm floundering and I'm not sure what to say, I want to listen to someone who has plenty. And, and li listening to uh, Reverend Rutledge, Fleming Rutledge, talk about Advent, the reason that she loves Advent it's part of her appreciation for how the church year moves people and shapes people. And, and we, we've experienced this. As the, as the colors change on the altar, we go from the Christmas, the white, the Christmas of season, the, the joy of, of, of saying that uh, God is with us, incarnation, that God loves this world enough to become part of this world. And, and then the epiphany, the, wait a minute, who showed up to pay attention to Jesus? And if those people can show up to pay, to pay attention to Jesus, who else might? And then, and the baptism of Jesus and the if Jesus is baptism be, to begin his ministry how do how are we our baptisms shape us and then Lent how Jesus grapples with the brokenness of the world and how does the brokenness of the world impact us and then Easter the the joy of forgiveness that forgiveness is offered and how do we live as a forgiven people and so the seasons of the year move 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 us and shape us and Advent's where we begin Advent is the season that we begin with, and what it is most often used as is a warm-up for Christmas. Think about the, the sermons you most often hear in December. If, if Christmas Eve is the warmest and fuzziest worship service of the year, like that's the height of the warms and the fuzzies. We have low lights and, and candles all over the place, and we're all singing Silent Night, and it's just, the air is, is thick and warm with everyone that loves each other. If, if that's the, the warmest and fuzziest moment of the church year, we use December as sort of the, the, the warm-up, right? Where we're getting all of our warms and fuzzies in the same place to be ready for Christmas Eve. And, and, and that's, I can promise you, Christmas Eve will be as warm and fuzzy as possibly can be. The sermon's already written, I can promise you. Warm and fuzzy, right? We're getting there. However, that's not all there is to Advent. That's about a third of Advent. There's actually a lot more going on with Advent. Advent, uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, Veni, Vidi, Vici, uh, I came, I saw, I conquered, the Veni is part of Advent, the Ven is I came, right? So uh, Ad, towards, and Vent uh, is to come, so Advent is to come towards. It is the, the season that we are preparing for Jesus to come towards us. And Jesus came once, back then, but that's not the end of the story, is it? It's, uh, there are three understandings of Advent, and these are the ancient understandings of the church. And how do you know they're ancient? They have Latin titles. If you, you, know, you know something's old if you can call it by its Latin name. And so I'll tell you the Latin names, and you'll get to hear me butcher them. So the fact that Jesus came, that's called the Adventus Redemptionis. By the advent of redemption, that Jesus came, was born, walked among us, gathered disciples, was crucified, uh, buried, rose from the dead. That's the, so the, Jesus came to us, fully God, fully human. That's the beginning of Jesus coming to us for our redemption. But there are two more. There's the Adventus Glorificamus. The glory, the, the coming of Jesus in glory, that the Jesus is coming again and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, uh, that Jesus will come in majesty and the kingdom of God will, be fully will come in his fullness. So that's the advent that is to come, the, the glorious advent. And then there's the advent of Jesus with us today. This is the one I can't quite get out. The Adventus sanct Sanctificatinus. Yeah, I, I can't say it. The, the advent of Jesus coming to sanctify us, to change us, to transform us day by day, coming to us in the word proclaimed and the sacrament offered. 
And so that Jesus came, that's the one we spend the most time on, right? That's the one that we've heard the most about over the years in, in December. <laughs> it tells us much about what matters, that Jesus wants to be with us, that the world is good. We cannot deny the goodness of the world if, if Jesus has walked amongst us in this world. That if we want to look for God, where did we find Jesus? Jesus was not in Jerusalem among the powerful. Jesus was out kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like, if you want to find God, where do you look? Well, you don't go to where power is. Like, don't be surprised where Jesus shows up, where God shows up. It's not where Mary expected to meet God. I mean, as mother. I mean, it's, don't be surprised where, by where God shows up. And so that's what we spend most of our time looking at. And there's a sense in which it's tamed, right? How many times have you heard the sermons about the Mary and the manger and the sheep and the shepherds and all of that? Like, can you, can you tell that story in your sleep at this point? Like, that story, we tell it, 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 it it's tamed, it's expected, it's comfortable, it's back then. There's a, there's a way in which it becomes maybe a touch, dare I say, boring, right? At least to me, I've got to come up with a new way to tell it every Sunday or every year. Advent has been practiced over the last century as four Sundays, because four Sundays is about what you can do with the, the, that one sense of Advent, that one third of Advent that Jesus came listening to the studies of, of some servants of the church who, who are helping the church understand all three understandings of, of Advent there, I heard the argument that we need to have seven Sundays of Advent. Can you imagine having seven Sundays of Advent? Like, that's all of December, and like, that's most of November. Like, seven Sundays. Like, and if all we talk about is baby Jesus coming, I can't be that cute for seven Sundays. Like, I just can't pull it off, right? But if there are other things we, we need to look at, not this that Jesus came, but that Jesus will come again, and Jesus comes to us now, well, go, there's some meat there. I'm not saying we should go to seven Sundays, but I can understand why you might think that. Right? Well, I'm not ready to go to seven Sundays of Advent because, frankly, it's not very comfortable. There's a lot of questioning that takes place when we start looking at the other two understandings of Advent. Right? Advent at the start of the year is not just about baby Jesus who once came and it wasn't wonderful. Advent looks down the road to... Jesus coming again and how that will change everything. Advent looks at the, the <coughs> and when Jesus comes again, that's, that's far less cute and that's far more majestic. And, and to discern how Jesus comes to be with us today, that, that, that's some discernment that takes some work, right? The challenge is to hold these three understandings together. And if we pay attention, we will see that our, our, both our readings and our hymns help us do that. If you, if you, the first hymn we sang today, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, right? the first hymn, or the first verse, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Born to Set a People Free, yeah, that, that's, that's about what happened then. But listen to the second verse a little bit more closely. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, not, not then, but born and raised for us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. Right? The, our hymns will remind us that there's more going on than just what happened then. And if we look at the, the readings that we have for this, the, these Sundays, I did not pick Luke 21. That, that wasn't my choice. There are readings that are set for, for these Sundays to help us understand this, the seasons. <coughs> And if we look at what uh, Luke is talking about in Luke 21, 25 following, this is not Jesus talking about how he was born and wasn't it cute. This is Jesus saying, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and upon the earth, dismay among the nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Jesus is talking about how he is coming again and there will be a dismay among the nations. And that makes sense. We, we call Jesus King of Kings. And when Jesus comes in the fullness to rule as King of Kings, I think dismay among the nations might be an understatement for how those who rule today will respond. If someone showed up and took ultimate authority over everything, how do you think people in power today would respond? Do you think dismay is the right word? 
I think it might be, oh, that's just the beginning of their response, right? There will be dismay amongst the nation because when Jesus comes, there's going to be some changes made. In verse 27, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory when these things take place. Straighten up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. What, it, what Advent makes perfectly clear is that Jesus is doing it. Right? Jesus is the one who is approaching us. And I think that's good news. I think that's wonderful news. It's powerful news because it makes it clear that while we partner with God, while we respond to God, while God, it is ultimately God that does the hard part. Like God is the one who forgives and redeems and sanctifies and saves. And then the best our response is straighten up and lift your heads. Like that's the best we can. That's the most we can respond with is we'll pay attention and say, "Yep, God's doing it." Right? Because that that's the nature of, of our relationship to Jesus. Jesus done the hard part. Our life is lived in response and thankfulness. Right? Everything I do, everything you do, everything we do is not to earn it or earn anything. Jesus has already offered us forgiveness and salvation and hope. Our response is a response of saying thank you. Getting our heads up, looking at Jesus and saying, yep, here he comes. Let's pay attention. He continues, and he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, re recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. There are parts of this passage that we don't understand because we're not there yet. When Jesus says, this generation will not pass away before this happens, I don't have a clue what that means. Like, I can do the standard preacher tricks, and I can tell you, you know in the Greek, that, that is ethnos, and that could mean generations, or that could mean peoples. I don't know. I, that's fancy Andy talk for, I'm confused. Right? I don't understand what Jesus is getting at there. And, and I will tell you when we get there, but we're not there yet. What I do understand is that when Jesus says that everything else will pass away, but my word won't. But you ever heard the line, you live in my house, you go by my rules, my word, right? That's kind of what Jesus is getting at here, right? Everything else might pass away, but my word, my way of doing things, that's going nowhere. You might as well get used to it, right? That's how it's going to go, right? My, everything else might pass away, but my word in my house. Jesus is, that, that's, that's how it's going to be, right? Be on guard that your hearts might not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. Worries of life, doesn't that seem fitting as December crushes on? And the day will come so that that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep alert, praying in order that you might have strength to escape all that these things are about to take place to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus ends this with a call to remember, to don't become dull, don't become comfortable with everything as it is, don't condone the way things are, never forget that Jesus is coming again, and that's going to change things. And so to get comfortable with how things are is to say that this is okay, and no, Jesus is coming. The reign of God, the kingdom of God, inaugurated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is coming in its fullness, and it's going to change some things. Right? Uh, in my head, I'm thinking of this sort of sermon series as the other two-thirds of Advent. Right, we're going to get to baby Jesus in Christmas Eve, and, and it will be very cute. But between now and then, next Sunday, we'll be looking more about the, the second coming of Christ. And, and then the Sunday after that, we'll be looking at how Jesus is with us today. And, and then we will get to the, the mangers and angels and, and shepherds. At the core of Advent is the promise of Emmanuel. God is going to be with us. God came to be with us once. God continues to be with us today. And God is going to be with us in the future. There is nowhere we, no, there is nowhere we go that Jesus is not seeking and desiring and working to be with us. And all we have to do is look, pay attention, and say thank you. Jesus is coming to be with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.